Good evening. <clears throat> Defending the indefensible. Last week, all of Orthodox Jewry throughout the world rejoiced with the release of Sholem Mordechai Halevi Rubashkin. Everyone that I know was interested in not only how he was doing, but when he would be released, if he would be released, why wasn't he being released, etc., etc. And you have to ask yourself, why did the Orthodox, especially the ultra-Orthodox community in its entirety, rally around a person who had been convicted, who had been found guilty by a jury of his peers, And the answer shouldn't surprise you. It's because we Jews have been subject to anti-Semitism for a long time. Over 1940 years. 1947, 1949, depending upon when the temple was destroyed. And from that time on, we have been wandering, wandering among nations who have raped our women, stolen our children, taken away our wealth, brutalized, cut us up, beheaded us, burned us at the stake, and in various different ways, try to get rid of us. We, Jewish people, especially the Orthodox Jewish people, know an anti-Semite when we see one. We know anti-Semitism when it happens. We don't need an explanation for it. The conviction of Shalom Otchei Rabashkin was a travesty of justice, a judge who probably is an anti-Semite who added on to the recommendation of the prosecutor in sentencing him to 27 years in prison when he had never ever been convicted before first time conviction And you compound that with the fact that he was supposed to have been accused of hiring illegal workers. And that's a major crime. Why wasn't he convicted on that? Why was that thrown out? Why was the bank fraud um, accusations brought to the forefront when the whole investigation was about illegal immig immigration? The feds came into the plant with helicopters, with guys in, in black uniforms arresting everybody they saw. Not a single worker remained arrested or charged. If there was, there was only a few of them. Over 389 workers and not a single charge against Rubashkin for hiring illegal aliens. If desk is up, what happened? And the answer is they had papers. Every single one of them had papers. And according to federal law, according to the guidelines of the government, he couldn't even question the paperwork. So they couldn't get him on hiring illegals because the illegals had paperwork that was legal. So they had to come up with an excuse why to arrest him and convict him. Now the whole scenario of feds coming in with helicopters, an invasion, was unnecessary. They were negotiating with the feds. The judge, 
together with the prosecutors, conspired to make this into a, a case of some terrible criminality that had to be attacked like a military operation. Armour, the Armour Corporation, had over 750 aliens, and they negotiated with the federal government to avoid an invasion of their premises and were slapped on the wrist. And that had been done only a couple of months earlier and the Rabashkins had hired the same attorney who had worked that out with the federal government. But the prosecutors in Postville, together with Judge Reed, who was in on the entire investigation, who conspired with them, Judge Reed not only handled the case heavy-handedly against Sholem Rothschild Rabashkin, when the Rabashkins asked for a review, a review, a federal, a, a, a state panel of judicial review, how does Judge Reed get on the tribunal of reviewing her own decision? When you go and ask judges for an independent review of a judge's actions, you ask for a panel to review the case independently, not the judge who sat on the case itself. How did Judge Reed get herself into that panel? The answer is it was rigged. It was crooked. It was done illegally, immorally, and it was done for some yet-to-be-defined reason. It had nothing to do with criminality. You see, the Rabashkins were successful, where the previous ownership had been a failure. They were successful because they kept costs down. They had to, in order to make a profit on even on large volumes, the amount that you make is minuscule, and if you incur heavier costs of labor and product, you lose your pants, which is what happened with the previous ownership. There have been accusations that they underpaid the people. They paid them fairly well. They didn't pay them great. They paid them fairly well. There were many who who stayed there. They didn't have to stay there. They stayed there because together with others, they could make a living. Ultimately, they could buy a house in the area and they could live reasonably well. I'm talking about the workers. When you have a plant like the Postville plant, when it shuts down, the impact on the community is exceedingly great. I know that because I was a mashgiach in a, in a town in Michigan, which the plant closed down. The plant had at one time 700 workers, and the plant eventually was taken over by other companies, and the workforce went from 700 to 70. And the impact on the town, which numbered between five and 10,000 people, was enormous. Town went from a thriving community to an impoverished community, which took decades and decades to even have a semblance of a comeback, which is exactly what Postville was looking at had it not been for the Rabashkins. They put Postville on the map. 
And irrespective of the fact that there are people who didn't like them, they're different. They look like me. They have a big beard and a yarmulke. And they don't eat pork. And they don't parade on Sabbath. And most of them don't play golf. They're not red-blooded Americans. What can we do? But they did infuse millions of dollars into the economy of Postville. They bought houses. The price of housing went up. They bought stores. They were able to make an impact on the entire community, helping the economy of the entire community. The reason why they were prosecuted had nothing to do with the criminality. It had to do with union busting. See, the Rabashkins couldn't afford a union shop. And the workers knew it. The workers did not vote the union in. And the union was upset. And the unions had a president by the name of Obama who um, had just been voted in. Who sympathized with the unions. And then there were people who didn't like the Jews. Plain and simple. Especially Jews who looked like me. So it was an old boy's setup from the start. Judge Reed said that the sentence was commensurate with the impact on the community. What was the impact? Because he defaulted on the loan. When did Rubashkin default on the loan? Only after he was arrested. Until the arrest, until the invasion of their property, they paid the loans on a regular basis. Yes, they had fraudulently gotten more money, a line of credit that was greater, but their business could handle it. Their business could make the payments. And they were making the payments regularly. They never skipped a payment until the feds closed them down. The feds knew that they would do that. And furthermore, the feds also intimidated potential buyers. We know who the buyers were. And they testified, and were ready to testify, that they had been threatened by the prosecutors. It was only after a significant amount of time and they got a buyer for about a quarter of what the place was worth that's when the bank lost so much money. After the arrest, after the intimidation, after they closed them down. And the ostensible reason why they closed them down was because of immigration. Why didn't they prosecute immigration? The answer is because there was no they weren't going to win a prosecuting on immigration because the papers were in order. So they had to make something else up. The judge said the impact on the community, but the judge and the prosecutors caused that impact on the community. The one who ran Enron, who literally caused $11 billion in losses, $11 billion got 24 years. Sholem Mordechai Rabashkin was paying his debts. The only reason why he defaulted was because they closed him down and intimidated buyers. The impact was caused by the prosecution, caused by Judge Reed, caused by her and her minions for reasons that we Jews understand.
because we've lived through 1900 years of that. Of course she'll hide behind her mantle of judgeship, her long robes, and her diplomas. But we who observed the case, we know the truth. And the Des Moines County Register, the Des Moines Register, defended the indefensible. And they are part and parcel of this witch hunt, this prosecution of an innocent man. The reason why the Orthodox community universally, unanimously supported Shalom Otre Rabashkin is because we've seen this. We've seen this in Rome. We've seen this in Persia. We've seen this in Assyria. We've seen this in Turkey, in Constantinople. We've seen this in, in Italy, in the Papal States. We've seen this in France and in England and the expulsions. We've seen this thousands of times. We've been accused of poisoning wells during the Black Plague. We've been accused of destroying the host in the, um, in the churches. We've been accused of murdering Christian children for their blood for matzahs. We know these accusations. We know how well-founded the accusations are. The people who were charged with those crimes were always the wealthy, the obvious Jews of the wealthiest, most well-known Jews of those towns. Sholem Bortre Rabashkin was such a target. He was the wealthiest Jew, a Jew who was successful. A Jew who was proud. That was too much for those people there. And the Des Moines Register. Has added to its eternal shame. By defending Judge Reed. And defending the despicable. Conviction. And sentencing that a hundred different prosecutors from all over the country, Democrats and Republicans said, was excessive and vindictive. And I stand by what I said.